Socrates and Plato, the ancient Greek philosophers from which Western ideas have flourished, believed that the soul was eternal. They also believed in the reincarnation of the soul. In this video, we'll review the five arguments that Socrates makes on his deathbed to support his views on reincarnation and the permanence of the soul. And this began a debate which still persists today, 2,000 years later. Does the body produce the soul? Or does the soul come from somewhere else? Hi guys, my name is Sandra and welcome to another exciting episode of Chasing Gods. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to my channel or to my Patreon page. So Patreon allows you to contribute monthly from $1 and up so that I can continue to make free educational content. By becoming a patron, you also get all sorts of perks like access to the longer audio version of my videos for your commute or night lullaby or access to behind the scenes videos or having your name in the end credits. Check out the Patreon link in the description box for more information. So let's go back to around 500 BC ancient Greece. The city-state of Athens has adopted a polytheistic religion, which means that people feared, worshipped, and made offerings to many different gods. Zeus, Poseidon, Athena, etc. The ancient Greeks also believed that upon death, the soul would leave the body and travel to the underworld, remaining there forever as mere shadows guarded by Hades, the god of the underworld. But there were also obscure groups of people who believed differently in regards to the soul. They believed in metempsychosis, or the transmigration of the soul. In this view, the soul will depart the body at death and re-enter another body in a perpetual cycle. These small pockets of people were the Pythagoreans, those who followed the teachings of the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, and the Orphics, the adherents of a religion based on the mythical poet Orpheus. How these groups obtained their views is not exactly known, but I can't help but think of India, which is geographically not so far away. See, the philosophical concept of transmigration, also known as reincarnation, already existed in India 500 years earlier. India is where Hinduism was born, and from it, Jainism and Buddhism, which also view the soul as something that transfers from body to body. The general belief in these Indian religions, which are still predominant all over Asia, is that we're all bound to an endless cycle of birth and rebirth. What you do in this life will dictate your next life. By doing good, you gain good karma. Think of it as points and you will be reborn in better conditions, be it in another body or in a heavenly realm. If your actions and intentions are bad, you gain bad karma, which will lead to worse conditions in the next life, again, in the bodily or spiritual form. And this goes on forever. But there is a way to liberate oneself from this never-ending cycle, which is also referred to as nirvana or moksha, and usually consist of a deep self-realization along with an ascetic life, letting go of all attachments. Now, Socrates never spoke about exiting a cycle, but he did believe that living an ascetic life of an attachment, which he calls being a true philosopher, will give you the best outcome after death. Okay, so let's make something clear before we continue. Socrates was a famous philosopher in the streets of Athens, but he never wrote anything down. Everything we know about him or the things that he said comes from different writers, most notably his devout pupil Plato, who wrote many dialogues featuring Socrates as the main character. One of Plato's dialogues is called Phaedo, which recounts Socrates' last moments in his jail cell before being put to death by Hemlock, ordered by the city. In his jail cell and surrounded by his weeping friends, Socrates reassures them that his death is not a sad moment. In fact, he argued that death is a moment that true philosophers practice for their whole lives. Because unlike the non-philosopher who's attached to the body and the material world, the true philosopher is interested in the soul. And death is the separation of the soul from the body. Socrates tells his interlocutors that because he has lived a life of a true philosopher, seeking knowledge and abstaining from materials and fleshly lust, once he dies, a heavenly realm, which he calls the upper earth, is awaiting his bodiless soul, where he will live among the gods and where things are fairer, smoother, 
and better. According to Buddhism, he hasn't reached nirvana, just a godly realm. Socrates tells them that all souls, once departed from the body, gather into the underworld and are escorted by a guide through zigzagging paths and arrive at their deserved destination, be it in the lower world of Tartarus or the upper world of the gods, or back into the body of a human or animal. And once their times have been fulfilled, the guides would escort them back to redo the whole process all over again. For eternity, souls weave through bodies and realms. I find it pretty interesting because the process which he describes is essentially the same as the Eastern religions, only with the Greek and even Egyptian mythology flair to it. But some of Socrates' listeners were not convinced by his ideas on reincarnation and the eternal soul. So Socrates makes his case with five arguments. His first argument states that there is a cycle of life and death. All things that have an opposite are generated out of their opposites. Largeness comes from smallness through the process of increase, and smallness comes from largeness through the process of decrease. The process is the passage into one and out of another. This process is true for all opposites. There is a wax and wine between them, which illustrates a cycle. Opposites cycle perpetually. This is the fundamental law in the yin-yang philosophy where at the height of yang, there is a seed of yin, and yin will begin, and vice versa. So Socrates asks, since falling asleep comes from having been awake, and waking up comes from having been asleep, shouldn't it be the same process for the opposites of life and death? According to this law, there is a birth from death to the world of living. Like many ancient Eastern philosophers, Socrates believes that life follows a circular pattern. Okay, so this argument illustrates that death turns into life, but we know that dead people don't come back to life. Socrates believes that the eternal soul weaves through life and death, but the cycle doesn't really prove that the soul is eternal, and it doesn't prove that the soul jumps from one body to another. So Socrates used another concept to explain the transmigration of the soul. He says that we remember things from before our birth. This is the recollection argument. According to Socrates, we're able to recognize forms because we experienced them prior to our birth. So we need to understand what forms are. See, Plato believes that our reality is constructed based on ideals, abstract ideas that are absolute, eternal, unchanging, which he calls forms. Forms are immaterialized. They cannot be replicated in our world, but they are used as the perfect example to make a thing or to compare from. So bring yourself back to 400 BC where technology didn't exist. Straight lines didn't exist in nature. Actually, straight lines don't even exist on a computer if you zoom in enough. However, we can perceive straightness in our minds and can thereby detect any deficiency from straightness. Socrates says that this ability to perceive straightness comes from a time prior to our birth and ultimately from when the soul belonged to the realm of forms or absolute. This applies to all forms, beauty, largeness, justice. These absolute ideals don't exist in the destructible reality we exist in, but they're examples we have known from prior to birth and have forgotten at birth. Socrates says that through living or philosophical exercise, we're able to re-understand them, but not because we're learning something new, but because we are recalling something we already knew. So far, Socrates attempted to prove that there is life after death, and that the soul existed prior to birth. Still, this does not convince some of his interlocutors that the soul lives on forever. So he tries to prove its permanence with these two arguments. The affinity argument. There are two types of things. Those that can be seen, such as a man, a horse, or a flower. These things are dissolvable. And there are things that we cannot see, like the idea of justice, goodness, or beauty. These ideas are eternal. Now, Socrates says that when we take the example of a person, there are also two things, the body and soul. If the body is the seen and dissolvable, then the soul, which is unseen, 
should be eternal. Another argument he uses to convince that the soul is eternal is the concept of essential form. In Plato's Phaedo, Socrates reminds us that everything participates in a form. A globe or marble participates in the form of roundness. It's the form that makes the thing what it is. A thing can participate in a form at one time and in its opposite at another time. Forms never become its opposite. Cindy can participate in injustice one day and injustice another day. When tea turns cold, it's the form hot that recedes and the form cold that takes place. The tea participates less in hot and more in cold. When something is receiving the opposite of the form it contains, the current form goes elsewhere or disappears. But some things don't work that way. Some things can only participate in one form and one form only. And here Socrates uses fire as an example. Fire participates in the form of hotness, but will never participate in the form of coldness. He also uses the number three, and he says that it's the same thing for the soul. It will never participate in death, only in life. Just like how fire's main quality is hotness, the soul's main quality is life. The soul is the bringer of life, the essence of life. Therefore, when death comes, life, which is the soul, does not disappear, but goes somewhere else. By now, all of Socrates' visitors were convinced, except for one, Simeas. Simeas suggested a theory which he compares to a lyre, a popular instrument in ancient Greece. He proposes that it's the unique assembly of the instrument's elements, including properly tuned strings, the frame, and the movements of the player's fingers, that produces a harmony. If the instrument was broken or non-existent, then there will be no harmony. So what if it's the same thing with the soul? What if the soul is just a product of the correct assembly of the body's elements? But Socrates refutes this argument in a couple of ways. Which leads us to Socrates' last argument, the top-down argument. He says that a harmony comes in degrees. A sound can be more harmonious or less harmonious. But a soul does not come in degrees. It's either a soul or it isn't. Finally, he reminds Simeas that a harmony cannot affect the elements that created it, whereas the soul can order the body even against its nature. For example, the soul can force the body to train for the Olympics, or it can refrain the body from eating even when it's really hungry because it wants to give to the homeless instead, or to protest a cause. To Socrates, essentially, if the soul can order the body, it must have come from elsewhere. Of course, Socrates' arguments are debated I could think of one or two things I would contest, especially with the scientific knowledge we have today. But that's the thing, we have a lot more knowledge today 2,000 years later. Yet, with all this knowledge, there is still no consensus within the scientific community when it comes to this issue, the body and soul. What is the soul and where does it come from? For most of human history, this question was for philosophers to investigate and religions to answer. While the word soul can still be used, the terminology has been replaced with the concept of consciousness, mind, or experience. A great deal of scientific studies were undertaken and results have favored Simeon's bottom-up approach. However, in the more recent years, more and more experts are challenging this materialist view. And because of this, the debate held by Socrates and Simeus remains. Only it's a tad messier, as views are numerous and not entirely polarized nor black and white. Let me explain these views as simply as possible. So we have the materialist, essentially where Simeus belongs. These scientists believe that consciousness is an emergent property produced by the brain's elements and circuitry. To them, it's no-brainer. Specific areas of the brain are activated during specific thoughts or emotions. And then there are those like philosopher David Chalmers, who believe that there is a hard problem to consciousness. Chalmers calls it the hard problem of consciousness. Materialist claims are based on correlation, but correlations don't explain why or how consciousness arises from the physical processes of the brain. Then there are scientists who lean towards the idea that consciousness originates at the quantum level, 
the deepest structure of natural laws of the universe. They propose that consciousness could be the building blocks of the universe. In other words, the universe is fundamentally consciousness. There are also doctors who work in parapsychology. So we're talking about near-death experience, children remembering past lives. And it's by virtue of these experiences that they believe that consciousness is not a product of the brain. Unfortunately, parapsychology isn't taken seriously by the science community. Some experts argue that the sense of self is just an illusion coming from our senses, thoughts, and feelings. And it's possible to transcend the self, in other words, letting go of the self and be identical to the experience. And we have the panpsychists. They believe that everything has a certain degree of consciousness. Birds, plants, insects, even molecules. Though what constitutes this everything is largely debated. And there are the mysterians. They feel that the hard problem of consciousness is not solvable by humans. It's something beyond our comprehension, just like our language is beyond a mouse's comprehension. Some believe that it will never be solvable and others believe that it could be solved but just not anytime soon. And last but certainly not least, there are those I call the daring questioners. When facing a fragile scientific mystery, they believe that going against the status quo may be a good way to solving the problem. For some, this means going against the public intuition. For others, like Einstein, it means going with your own personal intuition. And for people like Chalmers, it's giving a chance to the crazy ideas out there. As I mentioned earlier, it's not black and white. These specialists don't adopt just one single idea on consciousness. For example, Chalmers acknowledges a problem with consciousness, but he entertains the idea of it being fundamental to the universe. Though a part of me wants to take the Mysterian stance, I have to be honest, these connected scientific opinions only seem to reinforce platonic and Indian concepts of reincarnation and the everlasting soul. Hmm. Let me recap on why I feel this way. There is absolutely no evidence that matter produces consciousness. None. The quantum theory that consciousness could be the building block of the universe would explain the idea of the soul as an absolute, eternal giver of life. And if consciousness is the base, the general idea of panpsychism, which is everything is conscious to a certain degree, would make sense. Panpsychism works in the top-down model, but also the bottom-up. The computational makeup of a lizard is different than that of a human, making its consciousness level different. Who knows, maybe the top-down and bottom-up theories somehow work together. It's also been suggested that consciousness could follow a radio wave model. When you turn off a radio set, the radio wave is still there. Perhaps different types of beings are just like different types of radio set, experiencing differently. And if consciousness is experienced differently and by different things, the concept of reincarnation would also make sense. The Buddhist idea of exiting the cycle of reincarnation by reaching enlightenment contends with the scientific view of the self as an illusion of senses. Both of these views agree that it is possible to rid of the self. Yes, there are many gaps to fill, and again, these are just propositions, but they are not dismissible. Science, the study of physical matter, has become the standard for finding truths. But it does grind to a halt when it comes to the non-physical. But the truth of the matter is, no pun intended, that there exists another study, the study of the non-physical, the mind, and that's philosophy. Philosophy existed for millenniums, exercised by street philosophers like Socrates, academics like Plato, and spiritual leaders like the Buddha. Philosophy is the study of fundamental questions ranging from knowledge to existence. Just like science, it also deals with rigorous critical thinking, reasoning, and rationality. The difference between science and philosophy is that one deals with testing the physical world and the other with testing the non-physical world. Socrates, Plato, and Eastern mystics have continuously claimed that the truth lies not in the visible, but in the non-visible. Other intellectuals have said that it lies in between the two. Regardless, nature is about balance, so the least we could do is to seek it when searching for truth. And that means paying attention to the mind, just as we do to matter. <laughs>
Thanks for watching, guys. I'd love to hear your thoughts or your stance on the soul or consciousness. And thank you to all the patrons that are supporting this channel. A special thank you to Alex App, who's supporting Chasing Gods at the gold level. Hey, Alex, you and I, we have something in common. Like mine, your name is derived from the Greek name Alexandros, which means defender or protector of men. The name is a compound of the verb alexane, which means to ward off, avert, or to defend, and of the noun andros, a genitive of aner, which means men. Alexandros is one of the epithets given to the goddess Hera, the goddess of marriage and family, and the queen of the Olympian gods. Interesting, huh? All right, so that wraps up another Another episode of Chasing Gods. Thanks again guys. If you appreciate this channel and want to support it through donations, please check out the Patreon link in the description box below. There are other ways to support the channel. You can subscribe to it, make sure you click on that notification bell, like or share the video, or leave a comment below. Any help is really appreciated. Alright, thanks and bye for now.